Oh, and happy National Science Week, everybody. <laughs> Woo, yeah. It's all about science. We're on hump day during National Science Week. I think it's pretty special. Um, because tonight we have a special night. There's a lot of people here and I'd like to welcome those people who have never been to a science in the club. Thank you for coming this evening. Can I just get a show of hands of who has not been to a science in the club before? For whom is this your first? Wonderful. I'd like to say congratulations to Hal and Wall for that actually. A massive draw card for tonight's for tonight's event. Uh, my name's Kirsty Abbott. I'm part of the New England Northwest Regional Science Hub that's been operating for just over six years now and has done events during National Science Week, but also during the year. Throughout the year, we have run science in the club for four years now. And this is our third one for this year, kicking off on Valentine's Day with Sex, Love and Neurobiology with Sarah Mackay and Adam Hamlin, who's here tonight too. Thank you, Adam, for coming. Um, we've, also, um, we've also got another one um, at the end of the year, which is going to be Paleo in the pub, featuring Professor P Flint on Wednesday the 30th of October. And our UNE paleontological researchers are going to be the stars of that one too. If anyone, do, does anyone know Professor Flint? There's a bit of murmuring in there. It's going to be very entertaining. Put that in your diaries. But tonight... Firstly, I would actually like to um, acknowledge the custodians and stewards of our land, the Anawan people, who have kept the ecology of Australia um, in, their, in their heritage, in their knowledge, and I'd like to acknowledge their traditional ecological knowledge systems, because the ecologists we're talking about today um, have complemented and worked with that over the last 60 years. I'd like to acknowledge um, Indigenous leaders, past, present and emerging. I would also like to thank Inspiring Australia, The Hub and The Wicklow Hotel for holding these events regularly throughout the last four years. But we're here tonight to celebrate and hear about the lives of two incredible men, two scientists, ecologists, I would call them possibly the Attenboroughs of Armadale, <laughs> who between them, yeah, <laughs> Between them have 120 years dedicated their lives, their curiosity to the pursuit and knowledge and understanding of how our world works. It's a very special night for me too, actually, because one of the reasons I am a scientist is because of Harold Hewell, one of our speakers tonight, and the adventures and the stories he brought home to me as a child, knowing him as a family friend. I know for a fact there's also people in the audience for whom that was true for Wall as well, growing up with the curiosity, the questions, the answers and the process that they were taught throughout childhood and we do know that that is such a huge, um, has a huge impact in where we, we spend our time as adults in our childhood. So for me, I would like to honour both these men in what they have done for a lot of people in this room and in fact at this point... I'm going to ask those who have been a student or a colleague of Wall Wally's or Hal Heatwell to raise your hand. There's quite a few of you. We're going to talk about academic, tree, academic family trees a little bit later on and I'm sure a lot of you will feature in those. So I, tonight I would like to introduce to you Professors Harold Heatwell and Wall Whaley. Wall actually was an honours student at UNE in the very first year that UNE was independent of Sydney Uni, 1955. They both joined the academy at UNE in the 1960s, Hal in 1966 and Wall in 1965, and since then have gone on to contribute their knowledge in ecological areas from pasture grazing management and native grasses to herpetology, to understanding of our polar regions, of deserts, from ants to insects, from C3 and C4 plants right up to monocots and dicots, and everything in between. I would actually say that two hours tonight is absolutely in no way justice to these men's careers. But I would like to honour them by firstly myself, you might notice, I confess that I've dressed up in a suit to honour these men for National Science Week. But also, what we're going to do is give them half an hour each to talk about their history, their research, and a little bit about themselves and their adventures. Have a little bit of a break. We're not doing trivia tonight. 
tonight because I, I, I do want to dedicate the night to asking questions um, of these amazing, incredible scientists. So no trivia tonight, just a heads up. On the table, you'll see their bios. So you can know a little bit more about them, but they'll talk more about that. But there's also an evaluation form and pen. So at the end of this evening, I'd really appreciate some feedback from you. Um, before I hand over first to Hal, I've got two messages um, to read out. Because when special people like this talk, um, lots of people around the world want to send them messages. And I have a message wall uh, from Sue Wilson, Nee Dillon. She says, congratulations on an amazing career. As your neighbours in Box Hill Drive, I promise that we tried not to step on the grasses that you were cultivating. <laughs> And I have another message from Kath Turner, your niece, both to you and Pam, saying congratulations on being honoured tonight in such a beautiful way. Um, I will say also that Sue has tried to get in touch with him. Um, Hal's wife Sue is in transit to Australia and is just missing this night by two days. And so she sends her best wishes and congratulations on an amazing career. So without further ado, this is not about my stories, this is about... Wall and Hal, who both do things in the water, one with fish and one with sea snakes. Hal Heatwell, would you please grace the stage and tell us some of your stories. Please join me in welcoming Hal Heatwell. Well, thank you for coming out. It's, it's uh, so pleasant to see so many uh, familiar faces, people I've been wanting to catch up with since I recently came home after a number of years overseas at, the, at North Carolina State University. So this gives me a chance to, to see you and I want to talk to, to um, as many of you as I can uh, afterwards. Um, I'm going to start out with my very first lecture uh, and this is in 1949, uh, well before a lot of you were born. And um, uh, I was at um, Eastern Mennonite High School, and I'm addressing the Natural History Club uh, of, um, of that uh, institution. You'll notice the, um, the headdress. Those are, are prayer head coverings, which all the Mennonite women um, wore. Uh, it, um, this institution uh, now also has a college, and they still don't teach evolution. And uh, I didn't uh, uh, get any... Um, uh, knowledge of evolution until I got well beyond uh, that, um, that institution. It's very strict. Uh, they are not very heavy on education, and it was probably highly unlikely that I would have chosen an academic career uh, when I was, uh, was young, but I was so interested in snakes that actually it, um, it uh, dragged me out of this uh, society into the, um, the secular world. Um, we, um, at, at NC State, we have a, a number of graduate students, very large graduate student body, and also a large faculty. So each year they have a meet and greet. And uh, each faculty member is given three minutes to uh, tell about himself, what he does, uh, his academic uh, interest, research interest, and so on. And at the end of three minutes, they cut you off in mid-word. And uh, so uh, I'm going to now... Um, put 54 years of um, my career at, in teaching and research at the um, uh, university level in three minutes. After that, I'm going to uh, uh, expand a bit on, on various topics. So uh, this, is, this is what I, I was teaching at NC State. Those were the courses I gave. And we were also doing um, making videos for high school teachers and college instructors that are online and can be downloaded free of charge by anybody around the world that uh, fits in those categories. Um, and so, I guess, uh, anyway, um, I, uh, I take students overseas, and this illustrates that. I um, study uh, am amphibians and reptiles, which il that illustrates that. Uh, I study the um, um, uh, canopy biology, uh, the, particularly the grazing of insects on, on forest uh, uh, trees. This is a, a trip to uh, Madagascar where we used um, helium balloons to go across the canopy and, and collect their samples. 
We lived in tree houses. We had um, uh, sleds suspended below a dirigible to collect from the canopy, or we used uh, rope climbing techniques to get up and study uh, that. I work on coral islands and uh, spend a lot of time on the barrier reef here uh, studying birds and sea snakes. Some of our bird pictures. And uh, I uh, spent um, five seasons in the Sahara working on, uh, with 73 other biologists, well, other scientists, soil scientists, uh, ecologists, range managers, all sorts of people in uh, looking at the advancing Sahara and reasons for it and what could be done about it. Uh, my interest uh, ranges to the Antarctic as well, especially the tardigrades. You probably saw the recent news where they, they put some on the moon. Uh, these go into very deep dormancy, and uh, they can withstand uh, almost absolute zero, uh, uh, el uh, absolute zero, down to minus 273, um, and um, they can withstand almost everything. And a dormant stage, they go into dormancy and stay there for years and years, and in some cases as much as 60 years, and during which time they take off almost no oxygen. They can live in an environment of, of, uh, of you know, vacuum or in a, a pure nitrogen environment. So they, they're basically dead by all biological and, and legal definitions, but they pour some warm water on them and they come right out of it. That's some of our camping uh, places, a bit of a, a blizz. Uh, I'm actually going to be more than three minutes. I don't take this long when I give it. At the uh, I, uh, I write books. There's, there's some of the ones that uh, I've written. I uh, edit books. Well, it looks like somebody edited that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there are a few blank places here where when I went through just before I came, I realized that they dis disappeared. I um, uh, edited um, the journal Integrating Comparative Biology for Oxford University Press for 10 years. And um, I produced uh, uh, movies uh, for educational purposes, I've indicated before. And I stay within my three minutes. No, uh, probably. I totally timed that that was just three minutes. Just three minutes? <laughs> yeah. I've had a lot of practice with this one. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you switch to the, the next one. Yeah. Um, this is uh, something that uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, did for me. Uh, she drew a, a tree indicating my, my various interests in, in, in <laughs> research. You notice that the, the main trunk is herpetology and there are various other side shoots from that. The, my herpetology work led me into uh, various things sequentially and uh, sometimes the, uh, the direction and the, the mechanism of this movement from one field to another isn't exactly uh, transparent but uh, we'll get to that maybe a little bit later. Uh, this is my um, genealogy, and um, it goes back to Cuvier in France. And you may recognize Agassiz, who was uh, one of the um, American um, uh, famous biologists, and have a fairly uh, a good background in uh, winding up here, but then that doesn't stop. This uh, shows one of the HERP meetings at, um, uh, in Australia, at Australian Herpetological Society. Uh, the person in red is Rick Shine, who was one of my PhD students here at, at UNE. And uh, everybody else, well, except for me and for Rick, all the rest are, are his graduate students or his graduate students' graduate students or the next generation. So uh, it's, um, it's, it's humbling to, to realize the, the extent that what you do in, in teaching, which is a very important part of ac academia, one of the most important parts of academia, I think, is that you touch so many people, influence so many people, and help them to uh, realize their cherished dreams and their, their aspirations, that um, uh, that is, is one of the most rewarding aspects of academia. And uh, I had about 20-some oh, PhD students, and he was the one who had the most prolific uh, his uh, career in, in, in teaching other, other students. But by the time you add 20 times that, you get a, quite a, a, a large number of people. Well, uh, one of my major research emphases is sea snakes. I started studying those in 1968, and I'm still uh, working on sea snakes. When I started, there were very few uh, herpetologists that actually got underwater and scuba dive. 
And um, very little was known about them in those days, and now there's quite a large number of people studying them. But um, uh, they were, we're tracking some that uh, we had um, uh, transmitters in them that we could uh, use the re receiver there to find them so we could uh, track them and, 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 pl and plot their home ranges and how far they moved and, and that sort of thing. They're just some of the uh, sea snakes that we uh, worked with. In those days, uh, when I first got here, I wanted to study uh, sea snakes, and uh, I uh, called up the uh, deputy, uh, the hydrographer of the uh, Royal Australian uh, Navy and uh, explained my interest in sea snakes and asked if he could help me. And he said, well, show up at Cairns next, next week, and, and you can go out on a minesweeper. They're going on a sovereignty cruise. And I did that. And uh, when that came back to port, there was a, a um, vessel from the um, uh, Belgian Navy there. And they were on a, a study of the Great Barrier Reef, and they wanted some Australian scientists to join them. So I just got my kit bag and went from the, the minesweeper from the Navy and went over into the, the uh, military vessel of the, um, uh, of the Belgian Navy. And, uh, and uh, he had uh, uh, f a free uh, transport to do my work. And in those days, we relied a lot on, on this kind of help, um, filming um, ventures by commercial companies and so on, hitchhiking with uh, filmers to get out and do our work. Later, we um, got more into grants and, and so on. But those days, there was a lot of hitchhiking and a lot of um, uh, just do it on your own. Uh, we're milking some snakes there it's, and catching them. Uh, this is a, a fishery. Uh, sea snake fishery in Japan where they uh, get the fish to, uh, to eat and uh, for their skins. And um, they are very conservation-minded because uh, they, um, all the, the, the female snakes that they uh, kill, butcher, that have um, uh, large eggs that are well-formed, they put them in little gauze bags and, and, uh, and tack them on the wall of a cave just above the water until they um, hatch. And then when they go out to catch more snakes, uh, commercially, they um, release the, the newly hatched ones. Well, uh, just to, the, the global extent of mine, these uh, the, are my study sites over the years for studying um, amphibians and, and reptiles. The blue ones are, are sea snake uh, localities. The others are terrestrial one, reptiles. Uh, those are locations for study of canopies. And... Uh, uh, those are the ant transects. I didn't mention the, the ants on the, the previous one, but I did a lot of work on, on ants. And uh, the field studies of the tardigrades. And uh, okay. Now, what I what I propose to do, um, it's it's hard to uh, to summarize 54 years of, of working in in the, in the field and uh, publishing on, on that. And so I've given you a, a taste of, of the various kinds of things I've done. And uh, I thought what I might do now is, is just open it up for questions and we can, we can talk more about particular ones. I um, um, worked for five seasons in the Sahara, as I mentioned, and that, that might be one that might be of interest to people. Uh, you may want to ask questions about the Sea Snake Project, about the island ones. I might start a, a bit about the island one. As I said in the early days, we started out uh, pretty much on our own. And uh, in, uh, I was at the University of Puerto Rico for six years. And uh, while there, uh, I got interested in uh, doing a herp survey, herps being meeting reptiles and amphibians, on the various small islands around the, this archipelago. And the way we got there is we would pay a fisherman to take us out and drop us on the beach and promised to come back a week or 10 days later. Uh, we only paid him half the money when we, when we went. <laughs> and one, uh, one summer we gave a course in uh, island ecology and biogeography. And <clears throat> there were two, two professors, myself and, and Richard Levins. And um, we had uh, a research assistant and we had a teaching assistant and we had one student. <laughs> And actually, it was a partly research trip that we were doing the research, but we uh, would, uh, in the evenings, we'd camp on the beaches, often of uninhabited islands, and we didn't even have a tent. We had a, um, a lifeboat cover, which we set up as a tent, 
and uh, we would uh, lecture, and we would use the, the, the sand of the beach for our blackboard and a stick for the chalk. And when it came time to, to go out and, and have dinner, uh, the research assistant was a, an excellent uh, a snorkeler and, and spear fisherman, and he would go out and he would take orders, just as you, as you would in a restaurant. Uh, what, uh, what fish would you like and what size? And, and he would come in and usually he could fulfill that. And uh, that was one of the most rewarding uh, uh, experiences, I think, uh, for all of us. It was a, an excellent way to combine the, the pedagogy with field experience and work on that. And that led me into, um, that was one of my first jobs. My, my first research projects was the survey of the uh, reptiles and amphibians after I'd finished my PhD thesis. And uh, uh, I got interested then in uh, the islands themselves, and that's what led me into islands when I got to Australia. I started working on that. That got me into um, the, the plant work because um, the plants were an integral part of the um, island ecosystem. And uh, that led me into, into a botany thesis on the, the dynamics of these, um, uh, vegetation, the vegetation on these islands. And um, that got me into uh, community ecology in a sense because I thought, well, well, some of these islands were very simple ecosystems. And if you study those, you may be able to get some handle on, on how ecosystems function that you could then apply to more complex communities that were less tractable. And uh, so I studied uh, One Tree Island for four years and uh, uh, everything, the, the, the plants, the, the insects, the lot, to try to get it. But I found that was even too complex to, to really deal with. So I decided that I would uh, try Antarctic communities which have very few species. And that's why I went to Antarctica, and that's where I met tardigrades and got interested in tardigrades. And so one thing led to another. But the, um, the, the sea snake work uh, then led me into the earth science because I was interested in uh, how the different species uh, came to have the distributions they did. And so I went back into paleogeography and uh, related uh, the... Um, the uh, uh, relationships of these species and uh, figured out how they, they moved from one island uh, to, or from one reef to another uh, during a geological time that they were developing and speciating and, and why this, and how the pattern developed of where they were distributed at, at present. And uh, that's where I am now. And so um, I've, I have retired, but I haven't retired um, uh, completely. I've retired only from uh, doing what I uh, um, expected to do. I'm an adjunct now in one place, and I'm an emer emeritus in the other, which means that nobody pays me anymore, so they can't tell me what I have to do. But I can do anything I want. I can teach courses if I want. I can get grants. I can do research, and I plan to do uh, almost all of these things. But the one thing I will not do, and I'm not going to go to another committee meeting as long as I live. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, I didn't mention the, um, my, a Panama project. For several years in, in Panama, with um, a colleague of mine, Owen Sexton from Washington University, and I went down, and we were going to survey the reptiles and amphibians and work out their ecological interactions in an area that uh, was a gap in the Pan American Highway. The, as you know, the Pan American Highway extends from Circle, Alaska, all the way down uh, to the Tierra del Fuego on the southern tip of South America. But there is one gap, and that was in Panama. And the Panamanian government was going to uh, close that road. So we thought that this area that was uh, uh, hardly um, uh, visited by anybody, uh, uh, as pristine as you could probably get, would be a good place to go and, and, and see how it was in its natural state. And then when the road comes through, they would... Uh, uh, would, it would bring in all kinds of human influences and, and so on, and you could, you could track what happens as this developed and, and get some handle on the impact of the humans on these uh, native populations. Well, one of the problems was that the, the Panamanian government was supposed to do this in the next few years. Uh, that was in um, the 1960s. It's still a gap. And uh, what happened is that the, most of the money that was... Each year, the United States would give the money to build this road, but it somehow disappeared. And, 
<laughs> in, the, in the deep pockets, I think. And so uh, we did the initial part of the study. We got a lot of uh, really good ecological information out of that. But uh, that's, the, the rest of it is still there, and I, I don't plan to go back and do that. So if anybody um, uh, lives longer than I do and, uh, and uh, wants to go back and finish that, whenever they finish the road, well, you're welcome to, to take our start and, and, and complete it for us. Yeah. Just, just, just cite our papers, that's all. <laughs> um, in the Panama Project, we, um, we lived with the Choco Indians. It's a, a tribe of Indians, that um, American Emmer Indians, that um, um, were very primitive. Uh, they, um, I thought I had a picture there, which is why I, 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 I but I apparently didn't. Um, they um, uh, are, are river Indians. They live just along the river. They, they don't know the forest very well. And uh, we went there with a 20-pound with a bag of rice and, um, and uh, lived uh, with them in, in, uh, in a hut along the river. And the rule was that um, uh, you ate whatever was available. Well, if uh, there was some, some fruit growing on trees or something like that, bananas or whatever, that's what you ate. And um, if... Uh, the sugar cane was the only thing. There's a lot of sugar cane that grew on the riverbanks. Um, you ate that. And so when we got there with our 20-pound bag of rice, that's all we ate until our 20-pound bag of rice ran out. Then uh, somebody went and caught some fish, and somebody shot a monkey, and so on. And so we, uh, our diet became uh, very, very uh, varied over a long period of time, but very monotonous on the short, on the short term. There was a, a man named Tirso who knew enough Spanish that we could communicate fairly well with him. And uh, he uh, became interested in herpetology. And we used him as a, a source of information about the, the folklore of the local people and also of, the, um, of what they knew about the reptiles. And he had a very interesting uh, story to tell us. They, there was a, a, a snake that, was, that they said was, was, was da dangerous half the time. And what it did, they said, it would go and take a particular plant that would stick its fangs. This is not, it doesn't really happen, but uh, they stick the fangs in the, in the plant and suck out the juice. And that's what they use as venom. And then they come and wait in the trail. When you come along, they bite you on the ankle and you die. <clears throat> but only half the time. Well, as we caught snakes and, and preserved it, we realized that the, the reason it was half the time was because they, there were two species of snakes that looked fairly similar. And they thought that one species was the female and the other species was the male. And it turns out that the, the species they thought was male was the venomous one. And the species that, that, that uh, was female um, was, was harmless. Not even related, those species. They just looked sort of alike. And uh, so, anyway, he became so interested in our herpetology that he would go out with us and help us catch snakes and things. And one morning, just about sunup, uh, he came in and to our camp, and uh, we're in our we're the hut where we were living, and uh, he uh, had a five-foot, two-inch fer de lance, which is a, a very dangerous snake, behind the head. He'd see this, catch it, catch them, and so on. He knew how to do it, and he had it behind the head. And uh, he, we told him that we'd, we'd straighten him out about which was harmless and which were not. And he confused the two. <laughs> <laughs> and he had, he had a very dangerous snake holding it behind the head where it couldn't bite him and presented it with us. And when we, uh, he could see by our expression on our face that he made a mistake and he, he got very nervous. <laughs> and so we injected it with Nimbutol and, and killed it and, um, and preserved it. And um, then uh, we told him, look, forget all this herpetology that we're telling you. You, you go back to the way you were. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do this. Anyway, um, uh, have, um, two I have two minutes. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess we, we, don't, we won't go into any more <laughs> detailed things then, but, uh, but uh, uh, it's been an adventure. It, it's been a real adventure to, um, to be in biology. It's, it's been a rewarding life, and it's, uh, I'm still continuing. I'm only 84, so I've got a long time to go yet. <laughs> Thank you, Hal. If anyone would like to stay till midnight and take tickets to hear stories from Hal, I think we can probably organise that. Maybe hub members, do you agree we could probably do 20 bucks a ticket? 
Do we have five minutes each? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hal. I, um, you know, I want to say that one of the things that Wall and Hal both epitomise for me is this beautiful combination of understanding the world and doing their science and ecology through uh, theoretical and descriptive studies and also experimental studies. And the combination of those in ecology is very powerful. And I think that if you really, and if you're thinking about questions to ask in the next hour, um, you know, the combination of those three ways of sort of doing science and understanding systems is a really good place to start with these guys because they've done all three and they've combined them throughout their career. Wal Whaley, could you join us on stage, please? Wal has a, um, a very different story, and I think you'll enjoy hearing the differences in motivations for their careers, for Helen Wal's careers, and also what's sort of driven them in particular directions. Wal will talk, and then we're going to have a bit of a break and then Q&A, so please get your questions ready for Hal and Wal to answer. Thank you, Hal, and please join me in welcoming... Wal Whaley to the stage. Uh, thank you and welcome to everyone. Um, I want to talk uh, a little bit about regenerative grazing management, which is all the the go these days, and I want to talk about how we started off uh, looking at grazing management many, many uh, years ago. First of all, what did the original grasslands in Australia look like? Obviously nothing like they look now. And what can Tench in 1790 in Sydney he commented that the grasslands in the Cumberland Plain west of Sydney were composed of tussock grasses with mostly bare soil between the tussocks. And that, as we've found since, it covers pretty well the whole range of Australian grasses, grasslands. We've got tussock grasses with space between them, which may or may not be filled with other species. And then, of course, we have Dorothy McKellar, I love a sunburned country, a land of sweeping plains, of rugged mountain ranges, of droughts and flooding rains. Those last two are what I want to talk about and how our grasses cope with this country with droughts and flooding rains. What did the landscape look like originally? This is a quote from 1901 at the Western Division Royal Commission. I'll tell you a little bit about this Royal Commission. During the, 19, uh, during the 1870s to, 19, to the 1990, sorry, 1870s to 1890s, there was an enormous uh, loss of livestock in the, two th in the 19... 1901 drought, 1900 drought, the, uh, and they held a, a royal commission. And some of that makes very, very interesting reading. And this is that one chap, very friable topsoil. When I got away from the track, horses went up to their fetlocks in loose, friable soil. It was like a well-tilled field, and the moisture as it fell penetrated the soil and fertilised the plants. Now, this is 20 years later, it is scarcely an exaggeration to say that the very ground I'm speaking of rings under the horse's hooves, a change in a very short time to the actual appearance of the soil. Now, what was it like before this fellow was talking? We had large numbers of fossorial marsupials, both spe spe species and individuals, less than 2 kg in weight. Fossorial marsupials, these are little guys, rat kangaroos of all kinds of sorts, and there were millions and millions of them throughout the whole of uh, Australia, where we, where we live now. And these depended on large numbers of truffles, 
we, had we have large numbers of fossorial, uh, of uh, fungal truffles, which in those days, but now no longer, lived just below the surface. And they dug these up for food with their nocturnal digging. So the soil was turned over and over and over. The result was the very friable soil mentioned above, which meant that the uh, service, the um, surfaces reasonably absorbed the heaviest rain. Sorry for that spelling mistake. Okay, and we had large grazing uh, marsupials as well as these small animals and indigenous people. I want to mention both of those. Okay, I want to talk about now the Murray-Darling system. And we, of course, live on the tablelands up here. And to the western, we have the, the rivers, which go down to the Darling system. I'm not going to talk about the coastal ones, but it's the same system, but very much compressed. So we had the people and animals that lived up here. And if we talk to the local indigenous people now, they refer to these rivers systems flowing west as mothers, the mothers of the land. And that's what they were because they lived in a climate, as we have now, which was variable with droughts and good seasons. And during the rivers, uh, during the droughts, they migrated down the rivers and came back. In addition to that, we had the large marsupials, the kangaroos, wallabies and so forth, and they cleared out when there's a drought too. They either cleared out and followed the water and feed or they died. <coughs> okay, now let's look at what's happened in that last few years of the 19th century. These are actual livestock numbers in the Western Division uh, of New South Wales. Notice in, whoa, whoa, that's the wrong one. Notice that between 1880 and 1890, there were huge numbers of livestock. And this was that drought that killed off huge numbers of livestock. <coughs> and then the numbers have never recovered. I've taken this figure through. Uh, to 2010, and look, they never got back to there. What happened? Why was that? And that's a very a question that uh, I've thought a lot about over the years. So what did the landscapes look like originally going back? Whoops. Going back to this time. We got the very friable topsoil that I mentioned previously. Large numbers of fossorial marsupials, depending on the truffles. Okay, now, so that was our background. And during the, um, seem to have missed a The slide seems to have got lost there of rainfall. Never mind. Uh, two ways of regarding pastures in grazing, uh, grazing systems. Pasting is crops and a pasture is sown, grown and harvested by grazing animals. <coughs> and this was a, a way of looking at pastures that Alec Lazenby, the first, uh, the Foundation Professor of Agronomy and after whom Lazenby Hall is named. Pasture is sown, grown and harvested by animals. He talked about the links in the chain. Pasture species, pasture establishment, pasture growth, utilisation, economic evaluation. Notice there is a, a, a movement through. Links in this chain can be modelled. And so here we have Alec Lazenby's model, where we have 
species and, and cultivars, herbage yield, uh, proportion which is eaten by the animals, and animal production. Now notice this, the only mention of climate is up here as unimportant. Now Alec came from Britain and I've done a fair bit of reading of the uh, pasture management and grassland management in the 1930s. The British uh, in agronomists in 1930 were the first people able to manage species composition by grazing management, put and stake, take stocking. When you read those papers from the 1930s, there is no mention of water availability. It was there all the time. They were interested in day length and temperature. But ours are quite different from this, this model, uh, because the climate things are up there and the species and cultivars are given the driving force. Whereas in actual fact, as many of you know, sometimes to your cost if you come off farms, the climate is the driver here. Okay, grasslands as functional ecosystems. Interactions occur among the living as well as between the non-living parts. In Australia, the major driver is water. Whereas in England, the major drivers are temperature and day length. In this model, the manager is part of a functional ecosystem and is affected by actions and reactions that occur with it. And those of you who come off the land, have been there for many years, are aware of the, how the, the uh, changes in rainfall patterns, changes in temperature, affect the way you think about what you do on your farm. And here's a model uh, that actually takes that into account. And this is a much more realistic model uh, than the Lazenby one, which he wrote in the 1960s. And the temperature, climate, rainfall and temperature are the major driver. And that of the, those of you on the land are very well aware of that. OK, so what we've got is the actions here, buying and selling stock, fertilisers, livestock, turf, lambing time, burning, etc. You've got the plant and soil animal system affected by these actions and the manager's decisions, which are related then. I'll come back to that in a moment. And we've got the plant and animal soil system and the animal products which come out at the bottom, hopefully. In a drought, of course, they don't. And uh, the, these manager's decisions are made by perceptions, goals, macroeconomics, and society controls of advice. I want to talk a little bit about the manager's decisions because as those of you know who come off properties, they are determined by your age, your family, etc. We might consider a couple running a family farm and uh, their children are growing up and they're thinking in terms of we've got to educate the kids now so what we have to do is make decisions, maybe in, rela in relation to macroeconomics, these are our goals, so that we can actually get enough funds to pay for our children's education. And this may mean that they have to run down the plant animal system for a few years. Then take the same couple in their early 60s, the children have all gone off, one or two have stayed home and want to run the farm. So their goals are quite different. What they want to do now is build up the place so they can move, uh, build up the pastures and the, la the productivity of the landscape so they can hand a going concern over to the next generation. So these goals affect the management decisions and the actions within the, the, the whole system. So that's another way of looking at a grazing ecosystem. Now, concept of preferred and unpreferred plant species in a pasture. This is going down to 
a little bit more detail than we had before. There's a general view among ecologists, and the most recent paper came out about three years ago, two or a year ago, uh, is that grazing by domestic livestock always degrades live grasslands, particularly using the Lazenby model of pasture improvement, where you put inputs, put the livestock in, and eat it all up. Is this true? Is this true? Or can grazing animals be used to manage the species composition of a functional grassland ecosystem so that it improves and gets better in terms of its economic production? And that's what I... Uh, <coughs> that's related to the t title of my talk. Whoops. No, that's right. Grazing animals as tool for pasture management. Here's a grazing animal. It's got a slasher out the front. Got four cultivators underneath. Got a fertiliser spreader out the back. <laughs> so this is a little tool. I owe this model to, to Tim Wright, who came from Lana out, and some of you may know Tim. I owe it to him, but it's a great model. So what you've got to do is if you use grazing animals as tools for pasture management, in the Lazenby model, they are... <coughs> They degrade the pasture, they, are, they um, re remove things and tend to destroy it. Can we use these for pasture, for pasture management and for landscape improvement? <coughs> Two ways of using these tools. The first one is set stocking. You introduce a bunch of animals into a paddock and use the condition of the animals of the need to do anything more. And this is very much the Lazenby model. If the animals start to go down in condition, you do something about it in terms of taking some off or adding fertiliser or reseeding or re or something. In other words, the animals are the indicator of the need to do something different. Or we study the plant animal system in detail and use the information to use the animals as tools to manage the system and also as an economic return to pay the bills. And this is what uh, I and my students started looking at back in the late 1960s. Can you do this? What are the things that one needs to, to take under, into account to use the animals as a tool to manage the grassland <coughs> and to improve the grassland when that's possible. <coughs> OK, let's look a little bit at intensity of grazing. Low intensity grazing, uh, 5 to 10 D, that's dry, city, dry sheep equivalent for those who are not aware of it. In other words, you can take sheep, goats, cattle, rhinoceroses or whatever and turn them into a, into a number of sheep equivalents, dry sheep equivalents. <coughs> and low intensity grazing, 5 to 10 DEC per hectare. And what, do, what happens with your uh, tool then? The slasher is highly selective. They eat what they want and leave the rest. The fertiliser spreader, particularly with sheep, merino sheep, is not uniform over the paddock. And this happened for many years around the Northern Tablelands and the thing that struck me when I first started working on uh, native grasslands was that you had the sheep camp up on the hills and you had sheep manure that was X feet deep and all the nutrients were there and the animals carted the nutrients up to the sheep camp where they slept at night. Cultivators compact the soil and with long-term grazing, nutrients remain with the paddock but they're all in the one place and not spread around. And down away from the sheep camp, the surface becomes very compacted. And we've got measurements in the early work that some of my students did looking at the compaction of the soil from a sheep camp out to the paddock extremities. Now with high intensity grazing, Quite a different thing. The slasher is not so selective. They eat what's in front of them. 
when you have a large number of animals in small paddocks and you open the gate and put them in, they rush in and they all mill around and they are not nearly so selective. The fertilisers spread more evenly. Cultivators, the hooves, if there's surface uh, seed on the surface, they bury it <coughs> and they make the surface more permeable to water just with their hoof prints, and we've got data that show this. And so that, uh, that this happens over a short period of time, and animals come out, and you can organise them to move nutrients from paddock to paddock, and the soil surface becomes permeable to organic matter, air and water, so that you have a high intensity of grazing for a short period of time. Now, one of the best uh, <coughs> exponents of this art and the one who started it first was Tim Wright from Lana. And his father had um, used conventional grazing management. He'd spread fertiliser all over the place. There were huge sheep camps. And Tim came talking to me, how can we move these nutrients back? And he did, the, did it very simply by lots of subdivision. He was lucky he could move the water around and so he had water available and he, his grazing pattern was to... Uh, he'd had small paddocks on the sheep camps. If the sheep went in there for a couple of days, he then his next time he left in a couple of days was a paddock extremity. So they carted the nutrients back, which had an interesting... Uh, effect on a PhD student that I was associated with who was looking at the nutrients across the fence from a conventionally grazed paddock on one side and uh, Tim's on the other. And over the period of three years, she was doing soils analyses. The, uh, the phosphorus level in the surface soil increased. And some of my agronomic friends said, Those, that is wrong, that's crazy. No, it's not weren't crazy. The sheep were carting the nutrients back. Okay, so the next thing we did in the early days was how can you uh, use grazing animals to change the species composition of a native pasture? This had been done in the 1930s in Britain as I, as I mentioned earlier, but could we do it in Australia? And particularly on the, on the um, northern slopes, and this work was done by Greg Lodge at Tamworth. And what we had there was uh, grazing management to try and change this species, Aristida ramosa, which is a very poor species, uh, has very low nutrient value. It has seeds which penetrate the wool and the eyes of sheep and it right through into the, into the muscle. So the, the, at that time, the abattoirs at Gunnedah were rejecting something like 40% of the sheep coming in because they had uh, Aristida rumosa seeds in the muscle. And the, the, the meat was simply rejected by the examiners. Uh, another species, Bothrychloa macra, which is okay as a grazing as a major species, and finally, the wallaby grasses. Can you change using um, specific grazing management? Can we change the species composition um, to increase this good one and to reduce this bad one? And that particular treatment there after a few months, actually reduced it to zero, and this one then increased it. And so that was the first demonstration that you can use the grazing animals as a tool to change the species composition of the grassland. The bad news was that we didn't know how to manage the bare ground, so the bare ground went way up, which is not a good idea. But we've since learnt how to manage grasslands to make these changes uh, 
without the, uh, and this is by intermittent stocking, and um, without these deleterious effects. Net re result of that, that Greg and I put together a whole um, range of different species composition. This was the original species, native year-long green perennials, danthones, etc. And these are uh, tall, um, different, uh, different types of species. And so we were able to put together a model of how one could change these um, different types of grasses, pure, uh, uh, grass composition purely by grazing management. Now this was 1989. We know a heck of a lot more about this now and that is well out of date. The reason why I put it there is just it is an early model of how you can do this that we published in 1989. It was the first model that showed how this could be done in Australia. So regenerative grazing management, what do we mean by that? Can we do uh, the grazing management before that 1989 paper always was destructive. And there is still getting papers published in the grazing management literature saying livestock always do the wrong thing. First person to bring this approach of regenerative grazing management was Alan Savory with his concept of cell grazing. The approach was very high stocking rates in each paddock for a short period of time to be followed by a long rest recovery period. And the critical features for success of this, and that was the, uh, uh, it's critical to move the animals before all the herbage in the paddock has been eaten. If you go down that far, they become selective. So you've got to take them, put them in, in for a short period, out for a short period. It's equally critical not to gain, graze again until the perennial component has, has recovered. Now, this I've mentioned, I've said perennial component there. What I'm referring to is the valuable com perennial components, such as the wallaby grasses on, in this part of the world, or uh, if you're interested in ryegrass or tall fescue or one of those, and use it grazing this way. It's um, the desirable perennial passes uh, species, not things like the undesirable ones like the Aristata rumosa, which generally are slower growing. So it's critical to remove the animals before it's all eaten, equally critical not to gaze, graze again until the com perennial component has uh, recovered. means that the manager needs to be flexible with respect to ch st uh, property stocking rates. And in times like this around here, almost completely destock because there ain't nothing growing. So listen for the future. Paddocks that are eaten bare are sign of poor management and will take a long time to recover. So if one is uh, managing landscape, you've got to get rid of your animals early and you've got to predict and the way Tim Wright does this, at the end of April, he knows that there's uh, not going to be any growth in this environment, even if it rains, until October. So he goes around the whole property and says, how much feed I got in this paddock, this paddock, this paddock, this paddock, this paddock, this paddock. If I move them around, when am I going to run out? Uh, if I'm going to run out before October, that means destock, get rid of... Sell, sell animals until I can actually go round and know I can get, get home and hopefully... Uh, uh, and paddocks that bear will take a long time to recover. Factors of binning fodder to starving stock rather than the livestock to the place where the feed is is, a, is a, uh, disastrous for the landscape. And I get very annoyed... Uh, when I read in the newspapers that someone, somewhere, and the 
newspapers, reporters are great to look at this, who's got absolutely bare ground, starving stock, so they appeal to bring feed to the animals. Now, what does that do? That means that the animals can stay there and it also means that they are there to eat the recovering pasture at the end. And that's disastrous. So, uh, what we need to do, and I can't do this, I'm an, I'm a, an agronomist, grassland scientist, we need to come up with financial management systems that allow the livestock to go to the feed, rather the feed to the livestock. In other words, be like the kangaroos that left the northern tablelands in the droughts before, the, before we came along and put fences up and that sort of thing. When it was a drought, they left. So when the drought was over, there was no, li no livestock there so the grasses could grow and they would get well established before any animals came back. So that's what we need to do when we have droughts like the present drought. Mowing is just as bad as grazing in this context. I happen to be on the Landscape Management Committee of the university and I've been fighting with the uh, contractors that look after it because they mow it into the ground and they've killed all the grass in a lot of places and that has... <laughs> Mowing is just as bad as grazing in this context. OK, here's a little area just below Booth Block where the mowers are working quite happily. Now, this landscape here has a little bit of a... a um, that's a bit higher, so the grass has been killed by the mowers. This here is not... So, it's a bit lower, and so the grass say it has survived the mowers and see what's happened. This is taken just after the autumn leaves had fallen. So here all the leaves are held in the grass. So what are they doing? They're rotting down, adding nutrients and uh, organic matter to the soil. What's happening there? Nothing. OK, excessive mown area under the elms in Elm Avenue. <laughs> just near where a big white gum was blown down the other day. Look at it. That's absolutely bare. Now, what happens when it rains? Off runs the water. Uh, none of it goes in. And that means that the tree roots of the trees growing around become closer to the surface. So why did that big white gum just near that blow over the other day? Because it's... Its deep roots had died because the water doesn't get down there. Its surface roots were still alive. Surf, there was a bit of rain on the surface. Along came the wind, over it went. So it's not just the grasses. And here's dry grassland, ungrazed and unmown below Mary White College. And so what happens to the water here when it rains? It all goes in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I really love that sentiment that you've ended on, actually. Um, seeing as though everybody can very much observe the bare ground and where grass is still covering the ground around the New England tablelands. Can I actually just get a raise of hands as well here um, for who is from the land? Who's, who owns a property around the New England tablelands? A few people. Three people. Four, five. No, there's six, I think. <laughs> I'm sure all of you um, are aware of Wall's work. In fact, I know you are. But if you're not aware of that and you are managing a landscape, please get in touch with Wall ASAP. Um, it's now time for a break for everybody. Um, and please have a drink, stretch your legs, finish your dinner, and we'll be back in about eight minutes, five to eight minutes, for Q&A with Wall and House. First one over here, Michael. Uh, 
Helen Wall, thank you. Uh, very interesting um, uh, careers you've had and hopefully uh, plenty of time to come. Um, I'm an ecologist too and um, I uh, often um, go out in the field and I feel very lucky that um, I didn't get bitten. What have you been bitten by in your career? <laughs> Uh, lots of insects. Uh, I've, well, I studied, I've been studying uh, venomous snakes since 1956, and I've only been envenomated once. Really? And that's, uh, that's, you go to the South American meetings, and you shake hands with somebody, the ones that are missing fingers, you know they work on, on, the, on the snakes, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, no, I was bitten once by a sea snake. Can I actually ask you how, is it true that when you got bitten by the sea snake in true scientist style, you documented your, your decline and what the bite looked like as it progressed? Well, I would actually had a request from a, from a um, uh, publisher of medical books. They said, we don't have any pictures of sea snake bites. If you're ever bitten, well, please take a picture. <laughs> and so before we, we, did, we did the first aid on it, uh, it, it got me on the, on the inside of that finger and so there are two medical books now that have a picture of my finger. <laughs> I don't know that I believe that that's the only thing you guys have been bitten by, but we'll leave it there. You can think about it as it goes. Charlie, was there a question behind you, Michael? There's a question there too. Um, how did you hook up the tree houses to the trees? Sorry? Um, how did you hook up those little tree house things to the trees? Oh, in your canopy research, how how did you hook up the canopy um, research houses? Oh yeah, they well they um, they had a big blimp or a dirigible that was motor powered, and they could fly over the canopy, and then they would uh, settle down very near the canopy and drop these things on, and then people would go down on ropes and tie uh, uh, tie them onto there, and then they would build on, on the plat platforms onto that. And um, there were some uh, inflatable ones where they'd blow up with air, and just like a, like a, a Zodiac uh, raft or something, and they were much larger. And they would just drop that on the canopy and then uh, tie it on. And um, they had a port a hole in, the, in one edge, and you could uh, then uh, use that to climb down with ropes and go from the, the floor up to the to there. We, we, we spent uh, some days on, on those just living there while we were out um, collecting. And you could take ropes and go out from there and collect. Yeah. Did you stay on the surface? Did you have to have pee bottles and stuff? <laughs> were you like all those big wall rock climbers that have to take Either there was a long ledges? trip down to the yeah, floor yeah. By, by the rope. Some of these trees were 150 feet high. Can I add a bit about what I've been bitten by? <laughs> I, I knew it. <laughs> I remember one time I was out uh, on the, one of our western rivers and I was late at night, I was on my own, and um, I uh, spread out my swag near a, river, uh, a stream bank and about two o'clock in the morning I was absolutely eaten by mosquitoes. So I thought, this is no good. And so I packed everything up drove up a hill <clears throat> and spread it all out again and there's a introduced grass called Sencris insertus which has little <laughs> spiky <laughs> burrs and I'd spread out my swag in those and it took me weeks to get rid of those. <laughs> He's one of the few persons I've ever met that was bitten by a plant. <laughs> Question of the back. Thanks. Thank you for this evening. It's been it's been amazingly enlightening. Um, I am a Regen Agar, and uh, I have a question for Wall. Um, is there an ideal ratio between grasslands and forest or or tree cover? Ooh. Is there a, an ideal ratio of tree cover in the landscape, is what you're saying? Yeah. In an agricultural system. In an agricultural system. 
depends entirely on the system, and I can't be any better than that. Uh, go any better than that, because Say under Tim Wright. what works for Tim Wright? What works, what works for Tim Wright? What oh, what works for so Tim same, Wright? Yes, in that sort of system. Well, uh, one of the things that happened at Tim's place as time went by, I wish Tim was here, uh, is that he got so, um, so many tree seedlings that he had, had to go in and do some clear, some thinning of the tree seedlings because, again, with the um, long periods of rest, the seeds, seeds would germinate and the trees come up if things were, were right. And, of course, with uh, rest rotation grazing, you get... Um, <coughs> the, the animals are off for most of the time. In fact, it's probably about 90% of the time. Doesn't really answer your question because there's... No, it doesn't. <coughs> no, 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 but just say, like, is it a third? <laughs> I think you just have to do a field trip to a few places, Sarah. It's field trip time. Uh, g'day, Wall. How um, fantastic... Talks. Thanks very much. Um, if I can be cheeky, I'll ask a question of each of them. Um, of course. Please. <laughs> um, so, well, I'll stand up so you can see who it is. Hi. Um, so, um, uh, for Wall, um, I, I heard a talk from David Eldridge a few years ago about the cryptogamic crust that you know we had once in our grasslands and woodlands. How does does that? Do you see any return of that in um, in regenerative agriculture, or is that gone for good? Is you know, how do we get that back? No, it's not. It's certainly not gone for good, and um, the uh, cryptograms that that do that, they don't mind being trampled for a short period of time, and then right. they can re uh, re uh, regrow again. The the most important thing is the rest periods. It's the same with the whole thing as, as the rest. And uh, one of the problems that one has uh, managing land like now is that the rest period, the time you put the livestock back, is when the perennials, the lower leaves, are starting to senesce. But the lower leaves aren't growing right now. So there's a real problem. And the same thing goes for the cryptograms. Right. Neat. Thanks. Um, and Hal, um, everyone's a big fan of tardigrades, I think. Um, I remember as in biology class when I was an undergraduate student seeing one down a microscope that they'd brought back to life and I was hooked for life. Um, everybody is. Everybody is. Can you... Uh, but, but the only things we seem to hear about them in the news is that they, the Israelis sent them to the moon recently and they can live under, you know, all kinds of conditions. Can you give us one or two other amazing facts about tardigrades for those fans of those beasts? An, an amazing fact about tardigrades. Almost all the facts about tardigrades are amazing. <laughs> but uh, really, uh, but um, uh, the, the, the long-term dormancy is, is probably the, the most amazing thing. And uh, the mechanism of it isn't really uh, well known, but uh, several things are known about uh, how they go into this uh, and get out of it. And uh, before, uh, they have a, a rest or metabol or ordinary metabolic, uh, metabolic rate. And as, they, as the, uh, the environment dries out, then uh, they shrivel up into what's called a tun. And then in that state, then they uh, are very hardy. And in the other state, the, the active state, they're not hardy. They, they can be killed easily by almost anything. But once they go into that, but as they go into it, their metabolic rate goes to a high peak and then drops down and disappears. And what they're doing when that, in that active period of metabolism as they go into this state is that they're doing several things. They, uh, they are um, uh, uh, forming um, uh, uh, glycol and um, that uh, sort of stabilizes the structure so that they don't twist and, and the proteins don't uh, denature. The other thing they're doing is that um, they are changing the sugars into uh, one particular sugar that is not uh, oxidizing. Most sugars are oxidizing chemicals, and so over a long period of time, say decades, uh, there would be chemical deterioration independent of any living uh, process. And so um, they um, will 
convert all their sugars into this one sugar, which is not a, um, uh, an oxidizing one. So there's a lot of biological activity that goes into getting into the dormant state. And when they come out of it, there's another peak of metabolism that um, uh, is just reversing the process. Amazing. I think yeah. we're even more hooked on tardigrades than before. <laughs> Thank you. So that's just opened up so many more questions, Carl. In fact, how, what's the longest recorded time of tardigrade dormancy? Well, there's a, there was a woman at, the, um, at a herbarium in Italy that uh, tried to determine that. And the way she did it is to take all the collections of mosses that had never been opened. When, when you collect a, a moss specimen for scientific preservation as a museum specimen, um, what you do is you uh, let it air dry, and you put it into an envelope when it's dry. You seal the envelope, and it stays there until someone wants to investigate it, um, taxonomically or whatever. And then they take it out and uh, soak it in water, and study it. And of course, when they soak it in water, the tardigrades come out. So what she did was got all the museum specimens of the mosses uh, that had never been opened. And there's some that went back to 100 years. And uh, back to 60 years, she was still getting some live things coming out. But 100 years, I think this was probably wishful thinking. She said, well, she, they, some of them sort of waved their arm and then died. <laughs> Last hurrah. But that, 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 that may have been true because uh, what probably happens over such a long period of time is that uh, we're, we're always uh, bombarded by a cosmic particle, you know. And um, so uh, when we have ionizing uh, particles going through, uh, that does damage to the system, but we repair it. But if you're in this inactive, non-metabolic stage, you can't even measure their metabolic rate if, in, if in fact, they're not basically dead. Um, they, um, they can't repair any of these minor damage from cosmic particles. So perhaps uh, they are just so injured that they can't recover uh, from that. But uh, that, and that's the reason why that, uh, they just wave their hands goodbye. When, when, <laughs> yeah. Wow, 100 years, that's insane. But you, 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 you could say that, that um, numbers of years they could live in that uh, non, almost non-living state. Yeah. We'll do tardigrades on the next Science in the Club, I think, Carl. <laughs> Mary. Hi, Helen. Well, thank you so much for a beautiful um, talk tonight. You have both had very long and very interesting careers. Um, I'm wondering from each of you if there was one bit of advice that you would give to a younger scientist starting out today who also wants to have a very long and interesting career, what would that be? Enthusiasm, in one word. I've been, I still am enthusiastic about grasses. I'm in the process of doing the fifth edition of Grasses of New South Wales. And those of you who've been my students have seen various forms of it. Well, the fifth edition is hopefully a couple of years off. My, my, my advice would be similar. Do, do what interests you. Uh, it, it's fascinating. There's so many fascinating things to do. That's, it's hard to pick the ones that are most fascinating. But follow your dreams. And uh, you will make a contribution. Uh, people who do something that they find boring don't make much of a contribution. Awesome. Thank you. I like both those bits of advice too. <laughs> And in fact, can I follow on from that? Because one of the interesting things, Hal, about your career is that you've done three PhDs. Um, one in zoology, one in botany and one in geography. I'm, I'm, just, I'm really interested in what you see the value of doing a PhD is as opposed to following that interest as a research scientist without doing a thesis. Well, I, um, I dedicated one of my theses to my, my former wife who, who died 12 years ago. Um, and uh, as the only person who understood why I wanted to do it, um, I, as I was working on some of the um, islands, doing surveys of the animals and, and so on, and, and looking at, at, at biogeography, biogeographical problems, uh, I got more and more involved with the plants because they were part of that system. And uh, I had been a botany major as an undergraduate, so it was a, a long-term interest of mine. But uh, I found that uh, I was slopping over into that in, in, in dealing with the data. Uh, I didn't have the 
broad and firm understanding of the field. And that needed disciplined study. And when you're doing a lot of other things too, you don't really concentrate that way. And it was a matter of discipline to, um, and to get the broad background I needed to interpret what I was doing that, that, that drove me to that. When I went to the University of Queensland, um, nobody wanted to take me on because the, the person who finally did was forced to by the head of the department, <laughs> and uh, he outranked him. Uh, <laughs> so, and so they, they, were, they, they were timid about um, treating me like a graduate student. The head of the department had no, no problem with that. Uh, when I'd go to see him, uh, his secretary would say, what do you want to see him about? And for something about uh, what I was doing as a graduate student, she would say, Mr. Heatwell wants to come and talk to you. And uh, if it was something about the Barrier Reef, at the time I was the, the president of the very, uh, Great Barrier Reef Committee, and he was one of my counselors, and uh, so I outracked him on that. And uh, if, if, she, if it was about that, she would say, Professor Heatwell wants to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my, the first time I met with, the, with my supervisor on the PhD thesis, uh, I said he at ease. I, I, I was, he clearly was the person who knew more about it than I did, of course. And, and, uh, and uh, he, he soon understood that I was there to learn, not, not just uh, collecting degrees like stamps or something. Yeah. That's a nice sentiment, going back to a learn officially, as opposed to how we learn you know, naturally every day. Yeah, you know, I even signed petitions uh, that are rebelling against some of the, the, the policies of the department. <laughs> of course he did. In fact, there's another story there about changing the rules of a club in town, isn't it, from going from men only to women. I would like to, you to tell at some point too. <laughs> questions, where are we, Michael? Any questions from the floor over here? Danny, can you just wait for the microphone for us, please? Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. It was lovely. I've got a very simple question, but something I've always wanted to know. Who mapped the Great Artesian Basin and how did they do it? The mapping of the Great Artesian Basin goes back to the end of last century, would you believe, uh, when people dug holes and water squirted out. And uh, uh, I've read quite a lot of that because I had a student at one stage who was working on um, <coughs> springs that occur in the basin, natural springs of the water coming to the surface. And the figure that sticks in my mind that might be of use to your question is that there is so much water in the Australian Artesian Basin that if we took it all out and spread it over the land surface of the whole world, it would be a metre deep. Glad you asked that question. I didn't know that. Wow. Okay, I know there's a question over here, but um, shall I ask it for you? Um, actually, well, I have a question um, about why you have, I guess, been so dogged in your determination to study native grasses, and well, and and what has driven your passion for wanting to understand the management of of, of native pastures. I want to go a little bit back into my family history mm. in that my father uh, grew up on a property at Moree and went to Taz and wanted to be an engineer. His father, the property was a quite small one, and his mother was ill and his father said, no, you have to come home and run the property. So he did. And then in 1926 or five or six, they sold the property and bought some more, I uh, can't remember the name of the town now, down in the um, south of Tamworth. And they bought the, the, the land in 1926 or 27 and hit the depression and went broke. And so they lost all their money. And so Dad then went to the coast. He was a very good fisherman. Got a, a, um, 
uh, <coughs> commercial fishing licence and I was born down there and grew up there. And there was this hankering in the family for doing something on the land. Mm -hmm. And so when I first was doing ecology and went out and looked at the Western vegetation, I was absolutely fascinated. And then I um, came back to Armadale after doing a PhD in California on the on the, the biochemistry of seedling vigor of Phalaris, by the way. And then uh, Alec Lazenby had come and was working on, on introduced grasses here. I was in botany, didn't want to compete. So I wrote to a friend, I, or a chap I'd heard of actually, called Richard Groves in, Tam in um, CSIRO Canberra, and said, what's the potential for native grasses? And he said, join the club, I'm the only person in Australia working on the ecology of them. <laughs> so I joined the club and uh, as soon as I started getting PhD students and postgrad students working on native grasses, it just opened up a world. Mm. So I'm still doing it. Mm. And plenty more questions too. Yeah, we have a question over here on the slide. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, as most of the kids have gone to bed, I'll ask a question for them about the future. Um, a future of deserts and little to no red meat. What's your opinion on the future of desert desertification and will red meat be an absolute luxury? Okay, remember, I have, if you read any of the information, I have a, a plaque on my desk made for me my, by my son that says optimist on it. Uh, for much of Australia, a large part of Australia, the most efficient way of converting rainfall into food for humans is red meat. In other words, livestock grazing. All those, if you've ever driven from uh, Ningen to Broken Hill, you cross miles and miles of country that the most efficient use of the water that falls on that for human consumption is to turn it run cattle or sheep or whatever and turn the water into red meat. So that is one, one reason. The second reason for my long-term optimism is that Pam and I have six grandchildren. Not one of them has a child or looks like having one now. When we were their age, we had three children. In other words, when two generations of um, Australian Australians, and my people have been here since the first fleet, the birth rate is doing a drop. I had quite a session a year with a, a friend from um, the United States who's looked at human populations and he believes that the human population will settle down at about 50 million and then stopping start going down. There is enough water in the world to, go, to feed that many. And, but whether he's right or not, I don't know in terms of, certainly in Western countries, the, popular, the birth rate is dropping. We have a problem in the Middle East where it's still going up. Well, I, uh, I probably, well, I consider myself an optimist also, but then uh, Murphy was an optimist. And uh, a lot of people think I'm a pessimist, so I'm not quite sure what I am. But um, part of my, um, my um, outlook for the future derives from the, the five years I spent on the Saharan Project. There were 43 people, scientists, uh, from all, all different kinds of science, anthropologists, uh, uh, soil scientists, ecologists, the taxonomists, range managers, and so on. 
And uh, our brief was um, to use 480 money, which was money that uh, Tunisia had borrowed from the United States and was unable to pay it back because they had a closed currency. So the United States said that uh, if they used that money to um, improve their economy and, and, and environment and so on, then they would um, consider it paid back. So that's, that was the basis, uh, the financial basis of this project. And uh, these, the participating scientists were from a number of different countries. I've forgotten how many, but various ones in Europe and the United States and Australia and so on. And um, uh, the, um, we studied that and over the five-year period, and we found out why it, it was, the Sahara was advancing. It wasn't advancing on a, 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 a broad front. There were little patches. You'd have a, um, a drought in one area, and um, uh, the, um, they would continue to overgraze it. And a lot of this was cultural because the Bedouins that were in that area, uh, a person's um, worth was uh, judged by the number of head of, of stock he had, sheep, camels, and goats. And so they were, were um, very um, uh, hesitant about getting rid of any uh, stock and lowering the stocking rate to, to suit the, the, the particular uh, conditions they were under at the time. And because uh, uh, as long as you could count numbers, it didn't matter whether they were fat or skinny or just barely able to walk. And uh, so that was one of the problems. But uh, these were people who had been uh, nomads before. And, uh, uh, and uh, so it would rain in one area, one small patch, and they would all go in and graze that with a lot of forage. And then uh, would, they'd have scouts out. It would rain somewhere else, and they, they would move. But as the population grew, they had to settle out. And so the different uh, family groups and tribes and so on picked places that they thought would be the best long-term uh, gain for them, and they uh, settled there. And um, so now when, uh, when uh, there's a drought in an area, uh, they don't move out. They can't. And uh, so they overgraze it. And uh, the USAID put in wells, uh, deep uh, wells. And uh, now when you fly over the, the central part of Tunisia, uh, in every patch of, of newly formed desert, there's a well because the stock didn't die because they, they were lacking water. But uh, during the dry periods, there's no forage would come up. And they would eat the, uh, the perennials then, and then the Sirocco winds would come in and, and blow up sand dunes and so on. And uh, there's a cultural problem because um, uh, the, the Bedouins uh, were illiterate. They didn't read or write uh, Arabic or French, and most of them didn't know French. And um, so they uh, didn't understand the science. And uh, we had a 50-hectare plot that was fenced off. And uh, we had different grazing regimens in there and so on. And, um, and that we, uh, uh, you, you didn't dare um, uh, emphasize too much because of the results, because the feeling was that if Allah wanted it to be desert, it would be desert. And science had no, no, nothing to say about it. But we did take them out, and they could look down the fence line. Inside, there was fairly rank growth. And outside, it was pretty, pretty desolate. And we'd say, well, you know, things you can do to, to, to help the situation. And the question was, uh, when are you going to take down the fence so we can graze that? <laughs> and so um, I'm, I am optimistic that there are ways that, that, that we could... Um, uh, well, I think we're going to be in for a disaster regardless of what we do now. It's too late to recover uh, or, or prevent uh, some of the impending disasters that, that, that are clearly going to happen, in my view. But we could do a lot better, but we will be inhibited by uh, the failure of people to understand science and that, that uh, we've uh, let the public down by not being able to get that message across to the population at large. That's going to be the problem. So cultural issues as opposed to scientific ones. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Has anyone got a follow-up question? Yeah, in the front here, Tamara. Thanks. I'm sure you had moments where you either hit a breakthrough or you had a standstill where you didn't sort of know where to go on from there. What did you do when you sort of hit a wall? 
Well, you file the data you have and, and, and wait for better days because somebody's going to, to, um, to come up with something, some insight that will re relate to that, and then you may be able to interpret your data. Or the other thing you can do, which is, is uh, less personally uh, 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 enjoyable, is that you can, you can publish what you have and, and, and give your hypothesis and wait for somebody to shoot it down and say something better. <laughs> and uh, I, I speak from experience. Well, what did you? What do you do when you hit a wall? Three things: turn away and do something else, dig under the wall or climb over it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. Uh, yeah, publishing something well in in progress is always a bit intimidating I think as a scientist but I think it's probably sometimes the best thing to do isn't it yeah okay I have a question up the back there sorry you can continue oh, well, I was just I'm just going to say that that uh, that's that's how science progresses often is that you um, uh, you put out something that that uh, you think sounds reasonable but some a lot of other people figure that it, it uh, they have better ideas and uh, so they actually it stimulates them to to do research oh. Uh, to see, you know, my, my view is that if you have uh, two scientists that can't agree on something, the best thing for them to do is to write a joint grant application to find out uh, how you can reconcile the two views. But uh, that's not what usually happens. That's true. Question. Uh, hi, uh, Matt Bolton, uh, wanting to ask uh, Wall, uh, in these systems that you've worked in, is there a role for fire? in manipulating species composition or is it too risky and expensive one no. way or another? Uh, I wouldn't recommend it this time of year in this season. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, there certainly is a role for fire. It's been... Uh, the Canadians are very good at it, um, using fire to manage grasslands and I had a Canadian spend some time out here with us and this was his major criticism is you guys don't use fire and I said told him the reasons why that that um, uh, you've got to be so damn careful and you've got to have all the um, uh, everything behind you before you can light a fire that and uh, there's lots of times when you perhaps would well use it, but you can't because of, because of uh, weather, weather patterns. So from a sort of a safety point of view, as opposed to a biological and biodiversity point of view, be, you've got to have everything behind you, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Mm. Thank you. Question. <clears throat> Uh, just to follow up on that, Wall, um, I've heard someone suggest that um, drought play has some similar effects to fire. To what extent do you think that, um, that that's true? And uh, do we have less um, benefit from, uh, from fire uh, if we have had significant droughts, serious droughts? Does that reset the systems in a similar sort of way? Uh, it certainly does. The thing that a fire does that um, drought doesn't do is that if you have um, a, lot, a lot of plant material blowing away, then the nutrients in that is gone. If you burn it, it can be, if they have some rain, it can be washed into the ground. If there's no rain, then it goes anyway. So it's between the devil and the deep blue sea, essentially, and by and large, uh, we don't recommend fire on um, native grasslands. Although in Queensland, it's a little bit different. I'd like to, to go back and revisit the, what I, I said just earlier about the, the cultural implications. I wasn't implying any one, one particular culture. Uh, Australia has a large number of people who, who uh, are climate or climatic change deniers. The United States has almost half the population don't believe that global warming is a problem. And so I, I think this is a, a problem which is of all cultures. I was simply using the one that I'd, I'd worked with personally uh, as an example. 
Uh, Hal, would you like to comment on the, the effects of fire in our landscape on, uh, on, on fauna? And, and the difference between drought versus fire and, uh, and what's been happening uh, as a result of, uh, of the combination of changes in different places. Uh, it's something I don't have a lot of, uh, of uh, expertise on. I, I, uh, I would turn that over to, I mean, I think Walt uh, talked about that uh, better than I could. Uh, it's something that I'm not familiar with really in, in, a, in any uh, authoritative sense. Um, something that you both might both be familiar with, though, I know how you've done a lot of work on dieback um, around the New England area in the 70s, and while you as well. Um, in, in, the, in the environment that we are in now and in, in your research, how difficult is it to um, unpick or understand the influence of specific abiotic and biotic factors in their effect on, on dieback? You know, what causes dieback? And how, yeah, is it, is it difficult to unpick the factors that it caused dieback? <clears throat> Not really, because it's a combination of a whole range of, uh, of aspects. First of all, you've got the effect of um, uh, removal of trees, removal of bird habit habitat, and the then consequent increase in insect populations which eat, eat the leaves. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> the people here who are better qualified than I am to talk about that. But my experience over the years is that when you have a, a, a large, a long period of good seasons, like during the 1970s, then it all stopped suddenly at the end and there is no water. And the trees that had been defoliated because of the large insect populations which grew in the, uh, came up in the wet years just died because of the drought, because they had no roots, because they'd lost all their leaves. So it's a complex series, usually a time sequence of uh, events that, that causes the burst of insect population, and then the tree death at the end of it. Okay. Yeah, that my, my um, uh, information is, is a bit out of date on that since uh, Meg Lowen and I wrote the book on, on that book on dieback. Uh, I've done, I haven't really kept up with the, the latest literature on it. So, and, and that book is now out of print and they wanted it reprinted. And both Meg and I said, well, we've been doing other things and it's for someone else to bring it up, up to date. So what, I, what I'm likely to say is, is pretty much out of date. But one of the things that, that, um, that we found was that, uh, that the, the woodlands, where there were a lot of trees together, didn't suffer from it so much as those were out in, in the paddocks that were left for shade. And that it seemed to me that, that what happened there is that there was almost no um, uh, regeneration. So you had a population of isolated trees that were, were basically senile. And therefore, they were more subject to more stress than... than um, uh, than others, and but and when you have that that situation, then uh, any stress is likely to to cause whether it's it's defoliation by beetles or frost or whatever it might be, may um, uh, have a greater impact than it uh, than it would um, otherwise. So uh, it was uh, historical things were involved yeah. uh, in that as well. The other thing is that uh, the the defoliation by the Christmas beetles. Uh, the um, larvae feed on, on grass, uh, roots of grass, and the adults feed on, on the, the foliage of the tree. And so when you, you clear an area and put superphosphate over it, uh, you are, you're making maximum habitat for the, the larvae. And a given beetle can, can lay hundreds and hundreds of eggs. And so you have this huge population of larvae if you have a, a pretty good year. And they can come out, and we had cases where they defoliated the tree three times yeah. in a year. And so that was, that's one of the features that uh, found. But there, the that, that's only one of many. Mm. Only one of many. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Look, we've got time for probably two more questions if we have any in from the audience Gordon, before do you we. Want to say anything on dieback? <laughs> yes. <laughs> audience participation on dieback. No, more about dieback. 
more back than anyone in this room. Uh, I'm not sure whether to thank you for putting me on the spot, Wal, but that's all right. Um, my view on dieback is certainly that it is incredibly complex. And uh, some people will get up and say, oh, superphosphate caused dieback and that's the end of the story. Well, uh, that just doesn't fit as far as I'm concerned. And I think all the research work that was done through the uh, 70s and 80s and continuing research would suggest that it's an incredibly complex thing. And I suppose my view in a nutshell is if you look at it, maybe I'm being very simplistic, but if you look at from the 1820s or 30s or whenever, prior to that there was a few Aboriginals and a few kangaroos and the Aboriginals came and went to the coast or the, the plains, um, you had a very, very different ecosystem. All of a sudden by the 1900s you had droughts, you had sheep, you had rabbits. Uh, and then from the 1950s to the 1970s, you had pasture improvement, three times the number of animals, four times the production, uh, less trees, more grass, as Hal mentioned, um, and just a whole complete massive change in an ecosystem that had developed for, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of years. And all of a sudden, in a space of 100 years, there was this massive change. And I think at the moment, things have settled down, uh, maybe to somewhat of a, a new balance. But uh, yeah, it's a very complex and it is not a simplistic issue. And I could certainly agree with Wall on that. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Um, one more, any more questions before we finish up? Look, I will, I, okay, I will ask the last question then, because I, I want, kind of similar to Mary's question about advice. Oh, okay, and you can finish up with comments. Um, I'm interested, um, after having such long careers as well in science, of the two biggest changes within the research or the academic environment that you've worked in over the years, so somewhere between the 60s and, and now, what are, what are the two biggest changes that you've seen in that environment within universities? I just put one, computers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The biggest change. Yeah. That, that, yeah, I, I, I would agree. With, I would agree with that. I think that the in terms of its capa the capacity for data uh, analysis and storage and big data and that sort of change, and also just in the way that you work. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also it's also caused other things too. That that um, uh, you you can do so many things so rapidly, and even though it, it provides better uh, communication, uh, more and more people are are doing the science, and so we're not doing it sequentially, we're doing it simultaneously. And so even with the better communication, uh, that's, that's, that's one of the things that I, I mean, you, um, everybody's worried about before they publish their paper, somebody else is going to scoop them. Mm. That never happened in, the, in the previously. Very, or you could very, keep very up seldom. with literature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, could, you could read all the literature and you, you knew what everybody was doing because you go to a meeting and you knew what everybody's doing, now you don't. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Everything, a lot more complex. Things coming at you at a million miles an hour. Thank you very much. Um, I, I know you want to make a comment, so I'm going to ask you guys if, uh, for your last word for tonight before we draw um, our, our lucky door prize. Okay, my word is to the young people here, and I can see lots of them around. Uh, hang in there. Science is great fun. It is extremely satisfying, but you've got to put the effort in. I just wanted to point out that I'm sitting between uh, two um, uh, co-authors. Uh, uh, Kirsty and I have published a paper together with, with Meg Lauman some years ago, very, very early in, in Kirsty's career. And uh, I was talking to Wall the other day, and he'd forgotten that we have a paper that we're going to put out together. <laughs> now, you might say, well, where does this, where does, how does this come together? Well, years ago, uh, when I went to the Antarctic uh, on, on, on various occasions, we, all the scientists had to uh, have help with the, the logistics when they got there. You either helped unload the ship or unload the helicopters or wash the dishes in the galley or something like that. And my job was to help with the unloading. And um, I found that there were, were bits of grasses and stuff stuck in the, in, the, in the cracks of the crates and some had seeds on and things. And so I went to Wallen to get them identified and, and we decided we were going to put out a little paper. But we never got around to it. But now this, this paper's becoming important. Then it was just sort of a, a trivial observation. But now it's becoming important because as the Antarctic warms, uh, some of those seeds are going to be able to grow there. 
And so we can, we can now say, well, these are the things that get transported down. This is the kind of stuff that's likely to become established there. So uh, we just decided the other day we're going to put out this paper together. Excellent. Excellent. I love that you can work together from here. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of publications, Hal has actually brought some with him and they're on the table up the back. If you're interested in reading any of Hal's work on, pol uh, there's polar work up there, some tardigrades, herpetology, yeah, various, things, yeah. various things, and keep an eye out for World's New publication, the fifth um, edition, edition of Grasslands of... Grasses of New South Wales. Grasses of New South Wales. Okay, now stay yeah, there. Well, one, one thing, uh, the, one of those papers is the one that, that Kirsty and I are both authors on. Don't be fooled by the fact that her name is, is Kristen on that. Oh, yeah. That wasn't my <laughs> fault. It's my first international Meg, Meg, Meg Lauman read the, 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 the <laughs> proofs on that. I didn't. <laughs> Nor did Kirsty. <laughs> Thank you. I've got to thank you for my first international collaboration. Thanks, Hal. Um, okay, I'm going to get um, one of you to draw this. First in best dress, who's going to draw the Lucky Door Prize? Wall. Everybody get your raffle tickets out and Wall will draw the Lucky Door Prize for a 12-month subscription to Cosmos magazine. It is D, D... I haven't got my glasses on. 055. Yes, orange. D, orange D. D. 55. Anyone, anyone here? Thank you. Anyone? D55. D55. No. Oh. Hang on. Waiting, waiting. We might have it. I'm 56. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's highly likely then. Is that okay? Well, no, 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 we'll, we'll keep it. Um, while, uh, while you're looking in your pocket, I will remind you um, again of the 30th of October, Wednesday the 30th of October for the next Paleo in the pub. Um, but I'd like Deb Bauer to come out um, and join me actually, please, because we have a thank you for both Hal and Wal. <laughs> and while we're looking for raffle tickets, how are you going, how are you going? Have you found it? 55! Yes! We have a winner! Can I give <laughs> Congratulations. Um, please come and see me afterwards and I'll grab your details for subscription. Um, Deb and I, on behalf of The Hub, um, would like to thank you very much, Hal and Wal, for joining us tonight and in, in our congratulations of your career. And thank you for tonight, a bottle of red wine to share. <laughs> there is time to hang around if you'd like. The Wicklow will stay open for a little bit longer. Um, but please thank, uh, join me in thanking, and I thank you for turning up to honour these incredible scientists. But please join me in thanking Hal Heatwell and Wal Whaley for their contribution to science over the years and also their presentations tonight. Thank you. Thank you.